not doing this any 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 anymore this the whole relationship lasted perhaps a month and a half too like this whole thing went it was over a span of that time i make a decision i'm gonna break up with him i make a decision that i'm gonna break up with him after school all right so after lectures are ending i asked him to meet me um near unisa unisa had like this building i wanted it to be a neutral environment not near my school because i did not know how he was going to react not near his work or the building where he used to it, just basically somewhere neutral so we met by the unisa okay not far yeah from from brie taxi rank i meet this dude and I'm like hey how are you good good he hugs me he kisses me all that jazz and he's all happy to see me and whatnot and he's like yeah he was this dude was already talking big things right he was already speaking about introducing me to his family his family used to live um like not in downtown Joburg. he had his own apartment in downtown Joburg, and he was planning on taking me to his family one of these days when time avails when we when when, when he can yeah this dude was serious like he was trying to take me home to his mom and dad go on that day i forgot who that guy i did not pay too much attention to too many things but i knew that i did not want to get things to that point he already introduced me to his mamas the village mamas that sold for him that was the first hint that he would eventually take me to his own mama but i, I did not want it to get to that point i knew that i did not want to meet this man's mama because i didn't want to break his heart i knew at the stage that i was not going to be with him and that he was falling hard and fast or if not fall in so don't let it linger any longer I was gonna get him out of his misery. I knew this was not gonna last. I was definitely never gonna sleep with this guy because he was just too... It's like he was waiting for it with bated breath and I was not about to go and give myself to him like a piece of meat on a platter. He was too perverse and I did not know what under heaven he would do with me in that environment. Seeing as he was already so thoughtful, he had so many ideas about sex that I don't know what he was gonna do with me if he were to get me alone in a room. I didn't want things to get there. I really did not want things to get to that point. So I just, yeah, I made a decision. I'm going to leave this guy, this boyfriend dude. Made a decision. And I met with him uh, in downtown Joburg. And he rocked up with another gift. He rocked up with a gift. And his gifts were always very, very creative. This time around, I remember exactly what it was. It was a uh, a, a, a rose, right? Uh, um, a synthetic rose. And it was synthetic because he was a designer. He was into material cloths fabric and he wanted something that was going to linger and not die so it had to be synthetic it wasn't the real deal he made it himself this dude made a rose using fabric right he was creative i'm not gonna take it away from there was like i said diametric opposition this dude had characters qualities that were really amazing but on the other extreme things that were total deal breakers for me and these deal breakers were too haughty for me to ignore okay and then all the other things that he did then started to be very very suspicious because of the deal breakers so here it is that this dude gives me this gift like i told let me describe it to you it was a synthetic rose he made it using fabric as the designer that he is it had a stem and everything it had thorns and everything it had the uh, uh plant what you, what is this the flower part of it and it, everything it was a rose and this rose was ensconced by more fabric uh something that he pinned down he loved leather okay uh and it was this black this black leather cloth that he then put in like around this rose and a pin in the center to keep the thing in a bunch and again slathered it like he clobbered it with his perfume he's well, he slathered it with his perfume and then when I met him before I could even dump him before I could even break up with him I felt really bad right he's like hey baby uh, this is for you and then he starts to explain to me the symbolism of it all he's like you're this rose you know you've been crafted so beautifully and the leather represents me because I'm gonna like cover you and whatnot and the two of us are gonna be pinned together and set to offer. like this dude was planning forever with me and like I said if he wasn't such a creepy little pervert I might have found that romantic I really might have um and I was just listening to him just go like and go and go and go it's like why why under heaven do the guys that really want to be with me why under heaven to the men that are serious that would probably marry me in three months why are they so freaky like it's always been like that with me <laughs> The guys that were not trying to waste my time. The guys that were not trying to sing Yemi Ala, make me sing Yemi Ala Day's song. See me see trouble, when are you gonna marry me, yo? See, we've been dating for many years, now you want to leave me for your ball. I see me see trouble, you gonna marry me, yo? Today, today, eh? The guys that never would have beaten me around the bush. Men that would have married me at 22. 
men that would have made an honest woman out of me early, made sure that I started make, have, having my first child at 23, and just keep on popping babies all the way up until I'm 35. Give me a little catch up by 15. Men who would have done that in my life, that were happy to propose marriage within two days of meeting me, were always so extreme. They were always so creepy. They were always these psychopaths. I don't know what is going on. It must be generational. It must be a curse. But I've been pursued by that all my life. I've been pursued by that all my life. Dudes that were temperate, dudes that were chill. Like in other words, I could I could chill here. I'm good. Guys that were not creepy, that were not weird, that were not psychopathic. Guys that were not giving chilly, you know, frozen Michael Ely vibes. Dudes chilling underneath your bed while you sleep all night long. Dude out here at your closet smelling your clothes like yeah. <laughs> Men that were not that. Men that were normal. Men that did what men typically do to women, sometimes take them for granted, not call, not, you know, not uh, not validate them. You know, tell them. I had one boyfriend who once told me after I told him I loved him, he said to me, I love you too, but don't say it so much you'll wear it, <laughs> you'll wear it out. <laughs> he said, I love you too, but don't say it so much you'll wear it out. Yeah, and, that's, and to think that's the guy that broke my virginity. <laughs> The guy that broke my virginity once told me, I love you too, baby, but don't say it too much. You're going to wear it out. <laughs> I wanted that guy to be that serious with me. I like the guys that I wanted to propose marriage to me because it was normal. It was healthy-ish. It was kind of healthy. Uh, they were never trying to take me too seriously. They would disappoint. They would hurt me. They would cheat. They would this and that and the other. But the ones that would have made an honest woman out of me immediately... The ones that would have taken me to mama, I would have taken them to daddy and mama. I would have, that basically the dudes that were, were the good guys in society that don't waste women's time. That don't spin you around on the spot in circles. For five years, unto Jola, and not propose marriage. Not Lobola, and you keep on asking him, Kanti, the Jabu, how long we gonna Joller? How long we gonna Joller, brother? Mm. Dudes that were prepared to basically not waste my time and get my eggs working real now, fast and feel. I wanted seven children. I wanted a crash of kids. Dudes that were prepared to marry me so I can stop making that big family. Wow, so crazy. They were always mad men. They were always mentally ill. They were always psychos. I don't know what is up with that. They would fall literally heinously in love with me. Heinously. And they start doing these creepy things that very early on turned me off so badly that I just was like, I can't. It was, it was too much. They had psychopathic tendencies. And look at me all these years down the line still out here in these streets on that tip. Where it is that dudes that I was prepared to hang with because banale regulation, they're kind of temperate. They are not... Crazy psychopaths stabbing a woman 20 times because she tried to leave. They're ignoring me. But the ones who want me are the creepy ones that will out your clobber. <laughs> a gift they give you with their perfume. So that they can stink up your house with their scent. Like marking their territory. Almost like animals urinating. Almost like animals urinating somewhere to demarcate that as this is my zone. Men who are crazy have always been happy to marry me in a day. And now here it is that I am single at 40. Precisely because I just kept running from Michael Ely in The Perfect Guy. I just kept running from Michael Ely in The Perfect Guy. I just kept running. Like all my life I've been running from them. And the ones I was prepared to date were just dragging their feet. Dragging can a woman be more unfortunate? Except Jesus is Lord, right? We're getting to that. Mm. This dude clobbers this gift that he has wrapped up like a baby, a fetus, in, um, in some swaddling cloths. Or a burrito and he has wrapped me the what symbolizes me in a rose that he made with his own bare hands having invested his own might and his own creative talent to make me this rose and then ensconce it with this leather thing that represented him and then put a pin in the center like in other words we gonna die together girl we gonna go out like this like papa murder suicide that's you and me that was my first uh, um encounter with a murder suicide type boyfriend uh, and it did not get to the point of that level of extremity because I believe I cut it early enough for his psychosis to not kill me. Uh, but then I wouldn't, of course, not, not, it would not end with me, these kinds of guys, unfortunately. 
and I'm still suffering from that today. But at least now I'm wise enough. And never mind wise enough, but I'm godly now, so I've got supernatural protection, so that's what matters. I I, I would have inevitably married a psychopath that would have murder suicide me, guys. It, it's like, yeah, proper. I can't, I just kept attracting them, and I don't even know what that's about, because it's not like I have a family member that has ever died at the hands of a man, or a woman that's ever married a psychopath. Like, I don't know why this is pursuing me, because it's not generational. It can't be. That's why, I, I don't know what's going on with this. It's following me, and I don't know where it's from, because ain't no woman in my family ever had that kind of freak for a husband. Or boyfriend, for that matter. It's only been me. Maybe it's because God set me apart for this mission. And I said, let's carry on talking, okay? Here's my boyfriend, Archie, giving me this gift. Well, my now-to-be ex-boyfriend giving me this gift. It would have been romantic if he wasn't so crazy, right? And I take it, because that's the first thing that he leads with, right? He opens the conversation with this gift. Um, I'm yet to basically break up with him. <laughs> and he gives me all these explanations. I'm feeling already really trashy. Like, oh, I'm going to dump this guy. And he's, like, done this thing. He's gone out of his way to build this rose. He literally built it. He built it. He made it. With his own bare hands. With his skill. With his designer skill. He made it. It, might, it must have taken the whole day or two, three days. And I hate this thing. And I am out here dumping him. It's a gift, so uh, I have never in my life, let me just put this out there. I had as at that date, that date, never dated a guy. I had as at that date, never dated a dude that gave me a present, a gift, that was my boyfriend, that took it back because we were angry at each other, because we were fighting. He's like, yeah, I tended to be with guys that were mature enough to, if he's given me something, when we dump each other and scratch each other's eyeballs out, I keep it. He doesn't even demand it back. And for the first time in my life, I, I saw an immaturity in a man that oh, was just like astronomical shocking. And it also confirmed that, okay, I made the right decision here because he took back his present. <laughs> he gives me this thing and then I sit down with him. Remember we were sitting there and in the distance I saw the building Yaku Yunisa. Mm -hmm where they give lectures at Junisa and I keep on looking in that direction because I don't want to look at him because I don't want to see myself break the heart of this dude at this stage all of his cute don't matter like this is a tall handsome dude but yo he's just creepy now to me just like Michael Eady in the perfect guy dude out here walking around with light eyes he's, he's got these green eyes he's a beautiful man but I mean when you're a creep don't know beauty matter don't know beauty matter. Don't know beauty matter. Don't know handsome matter. All right, it doesn't matter when you are that creepy. It just doesn't. Anyway, mm, so here is that this very handsome man is just not anymore to me. Wang Tosa, and like even his perfume, his cologne, his scent is kind of and like there's nothing about it that is giving. I'm good, you know. It's just a, a poignant reminder. It's giving me nostalgia, not nostalgia, but what do you call it? It's a trigger. His, the scent of his perfume is a trigger for the thing that this guy is, and I'm not feeling it anymore. Anyway, whatever. I tell him, okay, this is not going to work out, and a couple of words, you know, built an argument that would be the least heartbreaking blow uh, to him. And he sits there. First of all, he was all leaned in listening to me, you know, chatting and listening, yeah. And then as soon as I was like, we can't be together, we're breaking up, he retracted his whole cup countenance right uh changed and he became like kind of uh, ice cold as expected i mean if somebody's busy dumping you you're not going to maintain a warmth about you right but then what he did was wear an aggression it wasn't even a disappointment but an aggression and he at that stage after i broke up with him um and i was as cordial as i possibly could literally i'm holding this rose that he has just given me in my arms do you understand in my hands and i had thanked him for it as well when he gave it to me i thought he would let me keep it i was prepared to keep it because it was my gift i didn't expect him to be immature man oh man i don't know if you guys have played that game called rapes when you were children he literally rapsed it out of my hand he ripped it out of my hand ripped it out of my hands y'all this man ripped his present from out of my hands silently like give me that give that back to me with that like on some you don't deserve this you're gonna dump me fine and he ripped it out of my hand and that's when i was like whoa whoa he ripped it out of my hand stood up and stormed off leaving me telling a man see like i was just shocked at his response i believe that that dude was in the beginning stages of a psychosis i believe that that dude was in the makings of the kind of man that would one day make the life of a woman a living misery a woman that he falls in love with. I, like, I believe that his psychosis basically was in its infancy. He was yet to graduate to a point of so much psychological manipulation and abuse. 
that he would then make my life a living nightmare. He could have very easily found me at the building again where I, I, I went to school. <laughs> In fact, he did. Like, yo, this guy, I'm pressed to pee now. I want to go use the bathroom and then come back. But I just want these people outside that are busy walking their dogs to finish doing what they're doing before I go. Let me let this con conclude to the three minute mark and then I will go. Okay. Okay, so he ripped that stuff away, left me like shower water basically pouring down my face. I was shocked at his reaction. I went home and I was like, oh, I told my cousin, I was like, this is how he reacted. And even my baby cousin, a high school student, was like, that was immature. That was like crazy immature. But, and, and then I was like, yeah, it was immature. But anyway, it, it's over now. We're done. So at least I've overcome that hurdle. He took back his gift, whatever, ran off with it. But the next week, he came to my school again. Whew, the next week he came to my school again and I had told my girl, the one that I was tight with in the, in the program, that uh, I broke up with him, you know. And again, she was like, you had to because you were uncomfortable there, right? When he came to my school, uh, my friend was like, what is he doing? Did you guys get back together? She saw him. Uh, he, this time around he didn't get inside. He didn't come in the building. He waited outside, right? So basically he waited for my classes to finish. Like, I don't even know how this guy knew my schedule, but he did. He waited for classes to finish. And as I was exiting the building, he was there. And of course he was there for me. And I looked at him and I was like, Philip, hi. Um, what's up? How are you doing? And he was like, I'm good. Can we talk? And then I'm like, okay, I break off from my friend. And I'm like, please wait for me. We used to walk to the taxis together also. She used to stay in Pratia Glen. Um, yeah, so... I asked my friend, Gemele, you know. Okay, yeah, I'm back. I asked my friend to wait for me. All right, um, I'm like, Gemele, while I chat with, with him, right? Uh, and I, I chat with him, and he's like, Karabo, are you sure you want us to break up? I miss you. Man, I'm really in love with you, blah, blah. I, I want to make you happy, blah, blah. All that. Yeah, this dude is actually trying to make a case, right? And like I said, this dude, ne if it was not for his perversity and all the other weird little creeping nuances, I would have been okay there. I wanted a man to love me. I wanted a man to take me seriously. I might have been only 20, but I promise you I would have been a bride at 21 if a man had made a decision to be serious with me. I was not just trying to play, just trying to have fun. I was never that girl. So a man that wanted to take me this seriously was huge for me. It was a big blessing, but eh man, lo mundo me da and something inside me was like, I girl, you can't. You, you've dealt with her, your own fair share of rubbish. Remember your first love? The one who broke your virginity, Aja telling you you're wearing out that I love you, don't say it so much? Yeah, uh, you've come from that. Remember the guy after him? Why, you were fag, like absolutely fabulously in love with him. But he was a cheat. He was all over the show. And he, like, <laughs> that ex-boyfriend of mine used to basically tell me the same stuff that Ty uh, Tyrese and Baby Boy would tell Taraji that yeah I sleep with other women but they don't mean anything to me you're the one uh, I love you and you're probably gonna be my wife and you you just kind of take in your stride the fact that oh maybe you're right but this dude is sleeping with all of Johannesburg the next guy after the guy who broke my virginity was like that telling me I love you yeah I sleep with other women but like it's you that I love <laughs> And I just took it. I came from that. And those memories kept going at the back of my mind. That Karabo, you've dated little idiots. You have dollar draft, girl. You've dated a dude that told you not to wear out the I love you. And you've also dated a dude that flat out in your face told you, yeah, of course I'm going to cheat, but like you're the one. <laughs> this guy's going to be on the straight and narrow with you. He's not going to cheat. He's not going to cheat. He's not going to give you grief. He wants to make an honest woman out of you. He, he, he has entry, he wants to introduce you to his mama. This person wants to take you seriously. On top of that, he's at that age where, age where it is that he probably wants to get married. I told you he was like four years to five years older uh, than me, right? So he was, I was 20. I, I didn't care. I was, I, like I said, I would have gotten married at 21 if a guy had proposed. I, I was not trying to just sow my royal oats or whatever. Yeah, so I was probably going to be a young bride. Young baby mama, like all that jazz, but, but age, there was just so many other flags. Like, this dude was just too much of a creep, like he was too creepy. This dude was too creepy, and as he was speaking, my feelings for him had already been drained. I did not have any feelings. The initial love at first sight or crush at first sight, that had been uh, exsanguinated by his uh, latter activity. And I just was like, I get some of the mona. I was not mature enough to think on a psychological level as to how this could mature, but I certainly had a gut feeling strong enough to decide not to give him another chance. And so I was like, I'm sorry, Philip. This can't work. 
um, my mind's made up. I, I, I can't. Like, Hadi, buddy. And it's strange. The way that I was so just besotted with the prospect of being in a relationship. The guy after him that I dated, that I lasted with for eight months, was gay. The way that I was so wanted to be in a relationship, I dated a closet homosexual after him. Uh, I stayed with a closet homosexual for long enough for me to basically evidence that I was a woman that was content with guys that were not okay to be with insofar as they were not crazy. <laughs> The closet homosexual, the relationship ended. I wasn't in love with him. I couldn't fall in love with him because he was too effeminate. But that relationship ended because he was trying to prove a point <laughs> and make some other girl pregnant. And that's why we broke up. And then after the closet homosexual, that's when I was with the guy that I was with for five years. And that relationship lingered. But then he twisted me in the wind and did not propose marriage. Because, but however, he wasn't crazy like Philip. He was not... He didn't. He, he wasn't unhinged. He didn't have a loose screw like Philip. And... I believe that the Lord protected me from basically a Philip phenomenon by letting me in my earlier years essentially settle with lesser men who have got violent character flaws, however, in whose hands I was largely safe because I was predestined, it appears, to be the victim of gender-based violence. I was predestined to die at the hands of an obsessive man because I have drawn so many of them in my life however the relationships only lasted no more than two months where it is that i was with a psychopath that was in love with me to the point of marrying me at just 19. it was too extreme the way that this guy was to a point where now i couldn't take it god made it such that i would never end up the wife of a man that would just kill me one day because he loves me too much like crimes of passion i had to be with insincere guys that were kind of fluffy playing around with me beating around the bush but at least I was safe. At least I was safe. Philip was in his infancy of this psychosis. A lot of times a person that ends up being a hard knock butcher of women tends to start first by slapping a girl or by stalking a chick that he has a crush on in high school. Following her home, uh, calling her at strange hours, cyber stalking her, pretending to be someone else, uh, you know, what is this, catfishing her on social media. They start little, you know? Just like a, a murderer, like a, a person that becomes a serial killer will first start by killing cats. Like his cat, his, his household cat will be his first victim. Uh, and then he will start to develop a greater hunger and then start killing neighbor's cats. And then one day it becomes his own mom. One day it becomes the girl in school, the a stranger in the alleyway. And then that's how it is that this person ultimately graduates to full-on psychosis. It starts little. It starts with small little things, do you understand? And I meant... A little bit of a Michael Ely in The Perfect Guy, but in his infancy. In his infancy. Philip was in his infancy of a psychosis where it comes to love with women. So I don't even know where he is today, what, 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 who he's married to, if he's married, if he's still alive. I don't know what's going on with Philip, but he had all the markings of a la later psychopath. And something in me, even though he had so much that was romantic going on with him, something in me was like, nip this in the bud in its infancy. Like, it is something that that, that is, like, don't let it grow, don't let it don't, don't feed it. Do not nurture or cultivate this beast. Sever ties. Essentially escape a kidnapping before you even know you're kidnapped. Like rejecting a date with a Tinder uh, serial killer. And, and like at the very last minute deciding not to go on the date. Only for you to find out on the news that some other woman passed away from the hands of the man that you almost went on a date with. That I believe is what happened with Philip. Like I cut things before he could graduate to a point of irritation. Likely, what I did to him probably was the foundation, would have been the foundation that probably made the next girlfriend in much hotter water than me. Just experiences of how it is that all these women he falls in love with keep on slipping through the cracks. And given that he already had something in him that was unhinged, he might have snapped later on. He might have slapped later on. He might have killed later on. I don't know what, have, what has since happened with Philip. But I, I don't have faith in how he was in relationships later. I just, I don't. Any woman that would not have looked past his romanticness and any woman that would not have looked past his sexual perversity would have been ensnared later by him. Inevitably, like, you don't just wear that kind of character and be okay in life unless you give your life to Jesus Christ. So, unless Philip... 
So unless Philip turned to the Lord, I seriously doubt today he's anything worth the while to write home about. I, I wouldn't even be surprised if he is in prison or dead. I don't know. Like, uh, you know, type of dude to kill a girl. Like, murder suicide. He is the thing. He could be a murder suicide type. That, that's what Philip was like. And he already had, like I said, he was in his infancy. He had not yet graduated to a particular point, but just as with any serial killer, they don't first just start killing. They, they tend to start with cats in the house, dogs, rats, just hamsters. Yeah, they, they, they start with like chopping off their sis baby sister's ponytail while she sleeps and the girl wakes up with no hair. Like that level of, of crazy psychosis in a child. And later on, I mean, I mean, of course, the guy became Ted Bundy. Of course, the guy became Moses the Toilet, of course, because why did he cut his baby sister's ponytail while she was sleeping? Mm. That's what was going on over there, and um, that, that Philip thing did mature. I don't know why. Okay, look, I think I do know, all right? Why the Lord drew such men to me. It is because of this kind of call that I have on my life. He wanted to use me for this job. I, it is not generational. What I'm experiencing is not generational. Nobody in my family has ever had a psychopathic husband. Not on my dad's side, not on my mom's side. It's literally new with me. This is a first. I cannot account for anything of this nature, Kohai. We don't have, like, wife-beaten women at home dealing with husbands that are wife-beaters. Like, we don't have domestic violence problems. Yeah, there are issues that we have, deity, with the types of men that tend to be the husbands of women in this joint. But never any abuse. Never any of this. Okay, so I have a cousin that every so often slapped around his girlfriend. But he is a man in the family. I'm speaking about the reception of such crazy behavior on the part of women. In, in the sense that them being with crazy guys. My cousin is a crazy dude to some other females out there of an unfortunate family. But like, the women in my family have never really had a crazy for a husband. I've had a cousin that's been slapped before, but she got out of that real quick. So, what I'm trying to explain is that... I guess I'm trying that the letter in that the in So therefore, for it to pursue me like this, I believe that maybe the reason why that's the case is because God wanted me to speak truth to this reason. He wanted me to speak to these things later on as to how they start and why it is that South Africa finds itself in this position of gender-based violence, um, how to spot this nonsense and where it is that you can find your only solution, your only way out. And I mean, that dude was, the, I don't think he was involved in witchcraft, Philip, right? At that stage, but he was already unhinged. And this unhinging, because of the increase in lawlessness that causes the love of many to grow cold, because of the increase in, in insanity, right, on the part of wicked men that are just getting wa worse and worse, wicked men growing, waxing worse, evil men and imposters waxing worse, be deceiving and being deceived like it's written in 2 Timothy 3, because of just how much people keep on opening portals using witchcraft, experimenting with sorcery, um, there then is this epidemic of such men as the as this men who are frustrated like philip with a woman that they desperately want to love but that keeps on slipping through the cracks she dumps him because she sees there is something in him unhinged and she just cannot risk her life anymore the day arrives when a philip then makes a decision that this time around i'm not gonna lose another garabo this time the garabo i meet she's staying and so that's when crazy stuff like pegamina pel happens like witchcraft to keep a woman looking at you only that that's when stuff like look at getting him but not only big i mean like pella but corobella using witchcraft to make sure that a woman um likes you at all a woman looks at you only a woman doesn't go out on you a woman doesn't leave you yeah or a woman comes back bring back lost lover that's when they start to invest in stuff like that that's when they start to get involved in in witchcraft because of the frustration of losing Women, they felt like this is this is my wife, but it couldn't have been, dude. You you had character flaws. There was something unhinged in you. I can't say, I don't know what's caused it. I don't know what is the root cause to make men sometimes so obsessive. And just from the get go, they're just like that. Maybe for them, it's a generational curse. They had a grandfather that was like a whole Ted Bundy. I don't know, but like just the the loss, the sense of of um lo loss, like the sense of uh defeat that they feel. Like having no control over something that they desperately want. It then graduates at some point to the use of spells. Using witchcraft. The moment they get taught in a country that has got so much witchcraft, like South Africa, somebody is eventually going to introduce them to the occult. The devil is going to put them in the path of a witch. That's why I say Philip was in his infancy. He had yet to get to that point. Hang lawyer. But like I would later meet, like just strewn all over these streets like a cadaver. Strewn all over these streets like cadavers at a car accident scene. I have met so many of them since. And this time around, unlike Philip, they've been involved in witchcraft. And the witchcraft is what makes them 
essentially graduate from killing the cat to killing people now. The witchcraft is what graduates them to murder suicide, to being the kinds of husbands that end the lives of their wives because they, they just could not fathom in their stride. Losing their wives the way that they lost a girlfriend 20 years ago, they will always remember Karabo. And then look at a, they will always remember Karabo and then look at a woman in the future and be like, you're not going to leave me again. I'm not going to go and make you a rose from scratch and cover it with my leather body and have you dump me afterwards. And this time around, I'm not going to just snatch it from you and walk away. I was still defeated. I came to you a couple of days later and I tried to ask you to come back together with me and you said no. And I mourned the loss of that. Never again. Is any woman going to walk away from me? The moment they learn about witchcraft, that's when they start to feel like the sense of defeat, the sense of loss that I feel over a woman that I really love that does not want to recipro reciprocate love. Never again am I going to feel it without even realizing that the woman left because you were unhinged. She did not leave because she didn't like you because with Philip, I entertained him until he wore certain character flaws. So what I'm trying to get at is that it tends to be people that already have got an they are already an unhinged. There is already an inclination within them to do strange stuff. They are already abnormal. I told you I'd never met a guy before, even though I was a young woman and encircled therefore by a lot of hormonal young men. I'd never ever had anybody be that perverse towards me, that crass. They all exercised self-control. They, they had the ideas in their minds. They had pornographic minds because they were young men with lots of hormones, but they didn't vocalize what they wanted to do to my body. When you go out of your way to be a creepy little sexual harasser with your words you're different from the majority of men who exercise enough restraint to at least not make you uncomfortable in conversations men who will make you believe that they want to whine and dine you and dote over you and really it's not about your body but it's about your heart and your mind men that will lie to you even though all they want to do is have sex with you but at least they are decent enough to brittle their tongue hold their horses you know not speak any random vile thought that enters their minds when you are a man that can just vomit vile conversation you're already kind of crazy there's something in you that's already kind of off right so that's why the women left they left because you refused to work on character you refused to seek the lord's face to cure you from this inherent perversity that makes you different from all other able to exercise self-control men other men that albeit having the same ugly thoughts as you know to put a filter in front of their mouths that the so that, so that they might not freak women out it is not every man that goes to a park and opens his trench coat, allowing his nether regions to dangle before children and women who will then flee from them. Other men might go to that park and look at women, find them attractive as they're jogging, and have ideas as to what they would do to them, but then not go out of their way to then flash them as they're jogging. But you're the dude that actually flashes. When you flash, you're freaky, you're psychopathic, and you lack self-control in a way that other men don't allow themselves to get to that extreme other men have restraint and these little remnant of men that don't have that restraint that allow women to see their deepest darkest crevices of their brains they're the ones that lose us really quickly even though they fall hard and fast in love with us and they're also the ones that put us in the grave they're the ones that kill us when we walk away and their first victims like i was phillips among phillips first victim i can account perhaps testifying even in court when Ten women have died at the hands of this man because he became a serial killer. She can then come forward in court and be like, 20 years ago, I dated this guy. He was my boyfriend and he already had signs. I dodged a bullet. I escaped it. I am not surprised, your honor, that he ended up murdering later on because the very thing that killed his wife and five other women, ten other women, is the very thing that I ran away from when I was just 20 and he was 24. And yeah, it is no surprise to me that this eventually happened, right? There tends to be the first people, the first women that experienced that side of a man. So what I'm trying to get at is that the character here, this de demon, it's a demon, this possession in their bones that makes them like this, that's what they won't deal with. They won't deal with the fact that you're obviously different from other men. Yes, when men come together, they speak crass, pornographic stuff about women. But far be it from them to just say that to women. They know that women are, are turned off by that kind of crazy. But when then you go and huddle with a whole bunch of men, speak about what you would do to women in that boy man cave, and then take that to women, your boys ain't doing that, brah. You're the crazy one out of the crew of guys. You're the crazy one. And so when you become the serial killer, your boys will look at you on some, how did this happen? I don't understand how Philip ended up killing 20 girls. But like, they don't know that Philip 
took their ugly man cave conversations seriously and out in the wilderness and started telling women what he wants to do to their bodies. Whereas Sizwe and Jabu and Temba spoke in the man cave and left it in the man cave. A little bit of a what, what, what happens in Vegas stays in Vegas. Their man cave is like Vegas. And they keep it in the man cave and they pretend to women that they are chivalrous and doting. But Philip is the one that ends up killing. The root cause, don't nobody know that Philip was that unhinged. These boys are like, I didn't see this coming. But so many of the ex-girlfriends of Philip did see it coming. Because Philip took the man cave to the woman's house. Philip is a crazy unhinged dude. Which is why a lot of these guys that uh, have got friends that commit gender-based violence crimes are like, yo, Minahir, I didn't see it coming. Like, pop. They, they like, I did not see this coming. I remember listening to an interview of a, of a dude whose boy <laughs> killed a girl, right? His boy chopped up a woman's body into multiple pieces. And this, this, this friend of his had a daughter, right? And he was like, for the life of me, I let this guy around my kid. I let this guy around my baby girl. Only to find out he murdered his ex-girlfriend. But I sometimes blame myself because of the way that sometimes Tina, as Amat daughter, we speak about women. We used to speak about women in a particular way and we were careless about it. And this man, this boy, this friend of ours, he took it to the extreme of that. And now I realize that I am literally a participant in a mutiny against women because we speak certain ways about women and my boy went and raped and killed one. We spoke about our wildest fantasies with each other. We did not act on them, but the one crazy dude in the room did. So they don't account for the fact that among them, as you're all huddled together, speaking smack about some females, that there's one who out there does not see any barriers. There's, there's no demarcations. There's no moral compass. There's nothing that has been built in him to recognize how far you go and no further where a woman is concerned. There are men who out here will thoroughly go and pursue a woman using sexual innuendo and not see how inappropriate that is and lack understanding as to why his boys are able to keep girls while he's not. Why his boys are able to marry wives and he's struggling to get past third date. And this is the kind of stuff that will then cause that crazy in that dude to then murder, to then start to manipulate using spells, witchcraft. As soon as then this, this little bit of a Philip finds out about sorcery, he then goes on right ahead, sa, 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 right? And starts to bewitch every girl that comes into the room. Every girl that he pursues, that likes him initially. He's then like, I mean, I'm going to hold you hostage using sorcery. I'm going to use witchcraft because that's the only way that you're going to stay. But you see, witchcraft does not just stop with or bring back lost lava or don't ever leave me or waza waza or whatever, right? It spells you, it's king, it's spirits. Witchcraft is the stuff of spirits. And spirits, you don't just dabble with them without them filling you. The Holy Spirit, when you interrogate him, he comes into your body. Well, similarly too, evil spirits, when you interrogate them, they come into your body. So therefore, when you've got spirits that, according to God, are malevolent, right? They are diabolical. They can only do no other thing but steal, kill, and destroy. They will then steal your faculties beyond what they already have been robbed of. You are already unhinged. You already lack self-control. You already are different from your boys. And now you're gonna, now you're gonna be super, super, super crazy different. Okay? Yeah, you already had character flaws and now thanks to partaking in fruitless deeds of darkness like witchcraft, you then are going to magnify the fruit of the sinful nature in you in that whatever was a, what was an existing character flaw that you had, it's only going to magnify. So if you were a pervert out here salivating licentiously outside of the lives of women who did not quite sign up for it, you are going to be worse in that regard. And because witchcraft is this uh, form of control, witchcraft is this thing that is basically the manipulation of people like puppets on a string. Uh, it therefore is very coercive. It is extremely coercive. So when you engage in sorcery, you start to become the kind of person that does not take no for an answer. Philip was able to take no for an answer. I dumped him and he took the no, even though he took it very immaturely by ripping his present out of my hand. And then three days later, he walked up and tried to get me back by negotiating with me. And I said no, and he left me alone ever since that day, never came back again. He was able to take no for an answer, even though he was unhinged. He was already unhinged, but a man like that, when he learns witchcraft, he finds a craft that can control people, manipulate people, and it is a form of um, control, right? So therefore, it is also a form of megalomaniacal intent over people's lives. You're, you, you feel like you're the lord of these people, small L. And when then they don't do what you want them to do as their Lord, given that you have filled yourself with spirits, you then manifest 
so much megalomaniacalism that you then become tyrannical and oppressive to a point of refusing to embrace rejection. You refuse to embrace rejection and when you don't embrace rejection that then graduates to the point of if the person that you refuse to take no from does not capitulate to your demands you then graduate to murder. You graduate to kidnapping, hostage taking. You graduate to force at to, uh, that gets to the point of neutralizing a life altogether. Witchcraft makes people megalomaniacal and makes them controlling and it makes them unprepared absolutely to take no for an answer. It makes them unwilling to take no for an answer. So the, uh, a Philip that would have engaged in sorcery would have been a Philip that once I dumped him would have planned to corner me one day when I'm going home from school or whatever. Take me into a dingy hole. Rape me all night. Hold me hostage and then maybe even kill me. That would have been what Philip would have done, seeing as he had already uh, uh, imagined to a point of describing it to me, what he would do to my body. So therefore, just the fact that he never got to the point of hitting that, he would have basically taken what he wanted anyway. It graduates men to murder. M women too, right? This happens on both extremes. Men and women out here being very crazy obsessed because they feel frustrated by what they imagine to be butterfingers, things that keep on slipping through their hands. They get tired of losing stuff. And they don't even realize that the biggest reason why they keep on losing stuff is because you have not built character. You are different from other people. You're unhinged. You are weird. You are perverted. You keep on telling women that you want to do this to them in the bedroom. And in what capacity and what fashion. They are not attracted to that. They find it heinous. They find it horrible that you are that descriptive with what you want to do with their bodies. They feel intruded, invaded. You are pervasive in your conversations. And therefore they leave. If, however... You were not like that. You might have actually kept a girlfriend for longer than two months. Because they refuse to look inward, do introspection, do not have an internal locus of control, but rather an external locus of control where they blame the world for everything that's happening around them instead of themselves. Because they don't look inwardly. Because they are not self-searching. They then look for extraneous means to control the conditions around them that keep on falling apart. And witchcraft is like the perfect guy's perfect weapon. Michael Ely in The Perfect Guy. Witchcraft is his perfect weapon. It gets Sana Nathan using spiritual manipulation, making a woman that wants to leave you because your character is flawed. Why are you beating up a man at the garage? Why are you speaking to me sexual in a window? Why are you white? Like these things are things that no woman should be able to, should, should be willing to take in her stride in a relationship. You don't want to work on them. I didn't leave you because I didn't find you attractive. I gave you a shot in the first place because I found you attractive. But then you wore so much folly that I got, I ran scared. Like you probably gave me red flag vibes. That's why I ran. I ran sufficiently enough to, even though I'm a woman and tend to desire intimacy and a commitment from from a man you who was willing to give it to me i fled from in favor of men that were not even that serious with me because at least they were not crazy you were such a bad crazy that i was prepared to be with somebody that was twisting me in the wind beating me around the bush stringing me along i, I literally chose to stay in a relationship with a man that was stringing me along above you who was prepared to marry me because who marries a man that's outwardly and overtly mentally insane who Women are better, they, 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 would, they would fast and furious choose safety. A safety first, do you understand? Over even love. If anything, it's part of proven psychological concepts like Maslow's hierarchy of needs, right? I like to say that in, in, in psychology, I like to say that psychologists are misguided theists in the sense that they know there's something out there and they're trying to account for the human condition and how it is and why it is that we are the way that we are, but without searching God out. So many of their theories are biblical in what it is that they're looking for, but they don't go all the way to the point of acknowledging God for this thing, the sense of purpose, the sense of understanding, knowing oneself, studying the psyche. They don't get to the point of realizing that that is a person's seeking out of God. So they just stop at creating theories like the hierarchy of needs. Uh, I have explained this before using Freud's theory of the psyche. You know, with the ego, ID, and superego. How it is that really and truly, Freud was searching out God, trying to explain even why people make the decisions they make. Coming up even with the superego to say that society is what regulates society's actions. Our morality, how it is that we're able to keep peace in our societies, is because we care about what other people think. But they, he is absolutely disregarding the fact that the invisible qualities of God are all over creation. Among the invisible qualities of God, of which are a conscience that we have, that is obviously the law of God written on our hearts that recalibrates us to what is sober and reasonable that we might not be barbarians that are reaching entropy. You know, people that are just self-destructive.
just completely finishing ourselves off with no regard for what's happening tomorrow. We have regard for what's happening to God tomorrow because there is an intelligent creator that gave us that balancing scale inside called a conscious. But Freud calls it a superego. He thinks that we are each other's regulator without recognizing that without the absolute morality of God. We would not even have that sense of regulation within to recognize wrong from right, enough for us to wag our heads at that which we call wrong in society, and enough for us to approve of that which we call right in society, sufficiently enough to therefore de disincentivize or demotivate people from doing wrong because it gets punished, or to motivate people or incentivize them to do right because it is rewarded, right? Freud has no regard for God in a way that, that that we do. We acknowledge that it's not so much the super ego that regulates society, but God in us through the invisible qualities, through the law written on our hearts that tells us what is wrong and right, enough for us to wag our heads at that which is wrong. And so we then formulate structures, laws in society based on those consciences. So psychology is really a misguided theism. Frankly, that, that's why I say, and so I, I can't really throw away theories that psychologists have come up with because they are onto something, however, that they have not completely finished the journey in studying, right? It's written in God's word that it is, uh, what do you call this? It is the glory of God to conceal a matter, but the glory of man is to search it out. So psychologists are these people who work in what they call a pseudoscience. Historically, it used to be called a pseudoscience in order to account for things that uh, objective science was not able to unravel, like how the mind works, how we get to reach decision, decision making, complex structures of that nature that cannot be accounted for in the physiology of the mind. Psychology bridged that gap. Psychology bridged that gap, right? Um, between physiological an empirical study versus that which is otherworldly ethereal and uh, frankly hard to explain. Mm. So therefore, when it comes to you using theories in psychology, uh, I, I don't write them off to uh, account or explain even human behavior in the light of the gospel because I recognize psychologists as men and women who are misguided theists. That's all I'm going to say. They are misguided people who stop at men at, at a very soulish, fleshy, many explanation for spiritual things. They refuse to acknowledge the spirit realm. That's what I'm getting at. But they don't realize that they're also explaining the spirit realm. And so coming up with their various theories. And among the theories, they can explain really the fact that women would much rather flee to safety first and foremost before they uh, accommodate the love from a man is the Maslow's hierarchy of needs. Like he explained it in his hierarchy of needs by basically putting things like um basic you know instincts like needs for food hunger thirst and all that jazz all the way down in that uh, rung of hierarchy and uh, the hierarchy of needs and then second in the rung uh, are things like safety maslow puts sex down there at the very bottom but a sex it does not belong there which is like their theories need tweaking however you can't throw out the baby with the bathwater. sex is not at the bottom it rather falls within the category of affiliation that's where sex, sex comes in but according to um these base people of the world that don't really know god they think that sex is 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 a, is a fundamental need of human beings no, it's not uh, it isn't it rather yeah it's uppermost however at the bottom indeed food we need all that stuff if you don't have food if you're hungry you're not going to be trying to fall in love you're not going to be trying to take anybody seriously you know what i mean you are just trying to take care of your immediate needs once you have got things like food and uh, and, and um you know being able to cater to your basic basic needs as a human being you can then graduate to things like security and safety so in other words you have shelter you know that tomorrow is guaranteed you've got food security you've got home security you've got this kind of all this yeah once you are shielded secure in place and you feel good like tomorrow is guaranteed that's when you start looking around trying to make friends that's when you start looking around trying to have um, a boyfriend a husband that's when you start to try to have babies and what have you but when you lack basic basic things such things as bosom buddying and chest bumping with people it's this too far which is why in my particular life you know it has not necessarily broken the living dads out of me to not have friends because my basic needs have been ignored and at that very rudimentary level my safety has been in dire straits and so too have my basic instincts my basic needs and so therefore i'm not really trying to go to parties i'm already trying to be with people i'm already trying to affiliate with them go to funerals for me it's like my my foundational first and second rung of needs are not met so we'll see gatherings and brides when I'm good in these two respects. But once these two things are catered to, I will more readily attend a funeral of a family member. Right now, I, right now I'm unsafe and unsheltered, so I avoid social affiliations because I don't feel safe around people, right? But then the third rung in, in Maslow's hierarchy of needs then is affiliation with people. It's affiliation. So first it's basic instincts, needs like drives, minus six like food eating drink all that jazz then it's followed by security i have a house 
then it's for and, and shelter. I'm protected. I'm not naked before criminals. All right. And then the third rung is affiliation. Once you feel like you're safe, you've got a home to go to. You've got a dad that loves you, a mom that caters to you, people that call that respond to your SOS. When you send out an alert, they are there to pick you up. Right. People who will form a search party for you to find you when you go missing. When you have those three rungs in place and those two rungs, then only you can think about best friend, boyfriend, uh, prize. Uh, affiliating with the earth and that's where love comes in that's where romance comes in that's where being in a relationship in with a romantic interest starts to become kind of relevant yeah that's when uh, being in a relationship with a romantic interest starts to become relevant therefore uh with the third and then the, the fourth rung is like secure so guinea um success prosperity all that jazz like you know getting your your big house your big car your big whatnot yeah when, when you start to basically want more what what who is that guy in the series of motivation anyway? He calls them satisfiers. Satisfiers. Once the hygiene factors have been catered to, hygiene factors of which are safety, security, housing, all that jazz, um, and then you you mature over to affiliation, you then start to start thinking about things like, okay, so I have a house, thank God. Uh, it's comfortable, I've got a bed, but it would be great if I had a three-bedroomed house. It would be great if I had a five-bedroomed house. So that's when you start to think bigger. That's when you start to think sky's the limit to want more and more and more. A sense of self-achievement to get more and more on earth than you already have. You can only want that once you've got the first three ranks in order. And then, of course, the uppermost rung is self uh, self um self uh getting raised like what's that aggrandized word like self actualization and self actualization is at the pinnacle and apparently most people never arrive there and i like to say that self actualization is really just the point where a person gets to being complete in christ and that's why i get these people are misguided theists anyway whatever so i'm out here now speaking about the rung where that's even before success and prosperity getting more than you already have um but really if you didn't get it you would still live affiliation the affiliation level it is above safety it is above safety, meaning that if a woman does not feel safe, she is not going to be at all at ease, comfortable with being in a relationship with a man. So if she does not feel safe with you, she will not care to be your wife. If she does not feel safe with you, she will not care that even though she desires that she should be committed to by a man in a world full of men that are not serious about commitment. Even though really and truly that's what she wants, she will fast and furious settle first. With a dude that is not as willing to make a commitment with her. She will fast and furious settle with a dude that is not as well, that, sorry, that is um, um, not as willing to make a concession uh, concerning her commitment ideals. But is at least not raising a hand to slap her and is at least not eerie, creepy, archer talking like Hannibal Lecter. Insofar as he's not oozing rape vibes, if she feels safe in his presence, she will stay with him in a relationship for three years, five years, ten maybe. Fast and furious before she will be in a relationship that she will be in with a guy for five months before he will propose marriage. She will leave the dude with the five months if he is not oozing safety. In favor of the guy that's gonna spin her around on the spot. What do you call this thing? String her along, stringing her along. In a ten year relationship with no marriage. Marabutlab. She is safe. It's comfortable. It's safe. Safety of which and security being the word in operation right now. If a woman does not feel safe, she is not going to care that you are going to put a ring on her finger. We are not so desperate to get rings on our fingers that we will disregard the importance of shelter, safety, covering, protection. A woman will run scared if she feels like this dude is going to ultimately drive a knife into her heart. And I ran scared even though this dude was a lot more willing to give me affiliation, a lot more willing to make out of me an honest woman, a lot more willing to walk me down the aisle. But like, it didn't matter. I went and I did it a closet homosexual after him followed by a guy that made me twist in the wind for five years and I stayed with these guys even though they were not serious randos because I was not in danger I did not feel a violence and see, 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 da, 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 in the background they did not hover around my offices come in without going even past security they, they did not do strange stuff they didn't knock on my window while I was in a taxi with my cousin they did not slobber their perfume on gifts they gave me. They did not act like Michael Ely in The Perfect Guy. They did not give me creepy, eerie vibes. They, they were not so possessive of me that they hated any person that called me. Anybody that, like, they, they did not twitch at the prospect of any other person talking to me. I, I was safe, even though, how sera, guy, like, Papa, you could, tell, like, what are you doing? I, with Three years, really? Four years, five years into the jaw, like, hey, Batum, what's going on? Yeah, but that dude would have married me under a year, probably. I would have been a young bride, but... <laughs> oh, who's my husband? What's a long I'm in danger. Danger, I'm in danger. 
this this is not gonna end well yeah i was in danger so i left i left these guys don't want to work on character they don't want to recognize that unless a woman feels safe she cannot just be with a man she can't but because they get involved in sorcery they then use witchcraft to say nobody says no to me nobody says no